of the State of Education, I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Peter Mullen, the former chaplain to the Stock Exchange. specifically about education, particularly education in schools, because I think this is really one of the most important issues, if not the most important issue of our time. So let us sing a hymn of praise for that almost everyone has finally seen through the sham and fraud of what is called our state education system. <laughs> Frankly, the system that has been operating in our schools these last 30 years and more amounts to child abuse. Yeah. <laughs> Which is to say, that our children's minds, when they are at their youngest, most imaginative, and most receptive, are being systematically deprived of the substance that can sustain them. I am not speaking out of some abstract theory. I have been talking to some youngsters real live youngsters, like the lad I was sitting next to just down there, not conjectured examples of what I have heard described as analytical and rising learning curve. <laughs> Bad language, even if it emanates from the government's education department, is still bad language and it doesn't come much more offensive than that. This is what the youngsters, I will not call them kids, because kids are nanny goats. This is, this is what the youngsters told me. So, we learn about Hitler, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, and the evils of capitalism. We learn about suffragettes. We learn about the slave trade. Ah, I interrupted. But did they tell you that it was English Christian gentlemen of the 19th century who abolished the slave trade? and that this abolition was secured and guaranteed by the Royal Navy. <laughs> and the biggest slave traders of all were the Muslims, and this trade is still going on. What? Such astonishment among those youngsters? You could have knocked me down with a GCSE paper. <laughs> Had they heard anything about the medieval trade guilds, which set high standards in a hundred industries and promoted charity? which they still do through the city livery companies today, 
Of course they hadn't. Do you think for a moment that the mindless Trotskyists who comprise the self-interested teaching unions would even know about these things? <laughs> and if they did know, their ideological prejudice would not allow them to mention it. Or the building of the medieval cathedrals, or the hospitals and the hospices, a European system of universities devoted to the pursuit of truth, something a few notches higher than GCSE. <laughs> no, nope, they didn't know nothing about all that. <laughs> So how about the Elizabethan settlement, which set up a humane arrangement of political toleration, of which their teachers are walking examples of its denial? Have they heard about the Civil War of the 17th century? About the beheading of our monarch in 1649? And the setting up of a politically correct tyranny under Oliver Cromwell? No. Have their wonderful masters taught them that the Industrial Revolution was not, on the whole, a bad thing, and that it greatly increased the wealth and prosperity of most English people, many of whom had been suffering near starvation in the romanticized countryside? Did they know, for example, that contrary to the obscene caricatures of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games <laughs> of recent and unregretted memory, <laughs> that when William Blake referred to dark satanic mills, he was not talking about chimneys in Lancashire and Yorkshire, but about the arid secularising prejudice of the new university. So what's the relevance of all this old stuff? Well, I, I, I come back to that beloved topic of the modern comprehensive school, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Did they know that all, or almost all, the politicians of the 1930s believed that they could trust and work with him? And so it was their policy of appeasement which led to the Second World War. I suggested to my young friends that it was the willed ignorance of this blazing truth which leads them to our contemporary understanding of the present world crisis and the threat from international Islam. No, sir, replied my young friends, but we did learn that John F. Kennedy was a great guy. <laughs> like John Lennon. <laughs> and so is Obama. Oh yeah, I said, trying to get in on the lingo, you know. <laughs> and we, we went for a coffee. <laughs> Let me say this. If there is a failure, or a lack, or a woe in any department of public life, the proposed solution is always to tinker one way or another with what that, the political class calls the system. But the very idea of systems belongs to that failed socialist, Marxist, corporist view of society. Tinkering with systems never, and I repeat, never does any good. Yeah. It was as far back as 1934, would you believe, that that great and despised elitist, T.S. Eliot, warned against the evil political notion of what he called men dreaming of systems 
so perfect that no one will need to be good. <laughs> and this is the trouble. None of the systems is any good. Remember the ritual calls that recur from time to time that we should get back to basics and return to traditional standards. In the comprehensive system, this is not possible. For the very people who operate it, most of the teachers were brought up in that system, and so they know nothing. They are not competent to return to standards of excellence, even if they wanted. They most certainly know no grammar. They say, I was sat, and I was stood. They say, I refute, when they mean, I repudiate. They say, rise to a crescendo, forgetting that the crescendo is not a pinnacle of sound, but is itself a rise. <laughs> Oh, they're interested in rises. <laughs> Moreover, they have a sullen pride in their ignorance, because not to be proud of ignorance would mark them out as members of that most despised class, elitists. As if the aspiration and ideal should be to function as mediocrities. Do we really want our children to be taught by mediocrities. The teachers themselves are the victims of two generations of institutionalized ignorance fortified by socialist ideology. <laughs> and personal self-seeking. This is the problem with education and by the way, I prefer to use the more homely word, schooling. It is the problem of socialism and bureaucratization. As soon as these evils take control, then an institution no longer exists for the benefit of those it was set up to support and provide for, in this case, the children. Instead, it exists for the benefit of those who operate the system. For, for the ignorant, the overpaid, and highly unionized teachers and their supporters in the local education bureaucracy. If you are looking for a shining example of industrial thuggery, then look no further than the annual conference of that peevish, self-centered mob which goes by the National Union of Teachers. <laughs> I should own up. I should come clean. I am not really a theoretician. Over the last 40 years I have taught in junior and secondary schools in some of our poorest districts with some of our most deprived, neglected and downtrodden children. We produced magical versions of Mozart's operas. I instituted the teaching of philosophy to children who were, were regarded as educationally irredeemable. And they loved it. And they came alive. Because we were... We were doing imaginative things. I am also a journalist and a parish priest. I have been speaking and writing about education for decades. And the response I often get is, it's all right for you, Mum, born with a silver spoon in your mouth. What these critics don't know is that I was brought up in the back streets of Leeds between Armory Jail and the Gasworks, that I attended the local junior school where some of the children were so poor that they came to school without shoes and many were hungry and half starved. There were 40 people in each class, and we sat in rows facing the teacher and the blackboard. But by the age of 11, we could parse English sentences. 
Most of our modern teachers won't know what pars means if it rose up and bit them on the arse. <laughs> We knew fractions and decimals and the times table. Yes, the light's flashing. We had a grounding in English history and nature study. We had the upwardly mobile chance of moving on to the grammar school or the technical school, which naturally led to apprenticeships at the university or the honourable learning of trades. Let us then chuck out the systems, the ideologues in the teaching bureaucracy, and try to find our way back to what was, after all, a decent upbringing for our youngsters.